Good morning. Good morning. Glad you're here with us today uh, to worship through music and study and fellowship together. Um, looking forward to this morning. Some songs that, uh, I feel like we haven't sung them in a little while. I love them. They're good. So it'd be, it'd be a good, good time of worship this morning. I want to encourage you to be engaged, participate, give it all you've got. Uh, Jesus deserves it today. So let's, let's do what we can um, with that. We're going to study John chapter 3 this morning. Um, some of you might know a verse or two in that passage. And so we're going to study some of that and see what the Lord has for us. But before we do all of that, let's, let's just go to the Lord. For us, it's our way each week. We're going to pray and center our hearts uh, where we need to be. Um, our weeks, um, no matter where you are, um, age-wise or stage of life, our weeks seem like they're built to push us away from Jesus. And we need this time, this gathering of the saints to come back together to remind us whose we are and what we are called to do. So if you'll bow your heads and close your eyes, if that's how you wanna posture yourself in prayer, you can kneel, you can come to this altar at any point. Um, some of us just need that moment and that place where we lay things down. We begin each week with confession. Um, that's just in your heart to the Lord. And it's a gift, it's a gift that he's given us that we get to unload our sin. We get to expose what we know um, has been wrong in us and through us, and we get to lay it before Jesus today. So I invite you in just in your own heart that the Spirit would draw up and bring forth those things that you need to confess today. And confession comes... Um, right along with what's called repentance. And a repentance, repenting means that we change our mind about something, but it's a, it's a, a guttural changing of our mind. It's, it's that, man, I, I can't believe I was, or I hate that I did. I don't want to be that anymore. I don't want to continue in that. So we turn, we change our mind from pursuing the things of the world that we might pursue the things of God. So would you do that? Remind yourself that you hate those things. You hate your sin. And you want to move towards Jesus today. And the Jesus that we are moving towards, in your sanctified imagination, you can picture Jesus. The author of Hebrews says, is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the one who began it and he is faithful to complete it in Christ Jesus. This is him which means that your salvation, your sanctification is not on you, it's on him. And you get to walk joyfully in that. But it says that he's the author and finisher of our faith and he endured the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So he's not disgruntled, he's not disappointed. He's loving and gracious and kind and he hurts for you. And like any good father, will discipline where it's needed. And that's how you know you're his. And that's the Jesus we're gonna worship today and that we'll worship uh, throughout this week and prayerfully for the rest of eternity. Father, thank you for this morning. I thank you for the gift of the gathering. I think so often we undervalue this. Lord, it's not entertainment. It's not a, um, a place to come and be served, God. It's a place to come and to worship, a time to come and to be with you and be with your people that our hearts might be realigned that the ways that the world seem to push us and pull us in, in ways that are away from you, God, you've called us here today to remind us to come near to you. So would you do that? Will we draw near to you in full assurance of our faith? We boldly approach your throne of grace with confidence today. As we worship, uh, Father, may it all be for you. May we lay everything that we have aside that we might glorify you and exalt you, magnify you as king above all kings and Lord above all lords. We're in awe that we get to do this. Uh, meet with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you'll stand, we'll be led in worship together. Every breath it is a gift 
Every moment is a treasure All my past and my regrets My present and my future That's right Every table is a feast Every heartbeat is an altar my eyes upon you I fix my eyes upon you
Closer than you think, I promise. Yes, I promise. And oh, why you won't let go? I won't let go. I see you right where you are, and I'm holding. Let 
Hope you believe that this morning. Listen, God's, uh, he's not ignorant of where you've been and what you've done and where I've been and what I've done. He's not surprised by our sinfulness. He's not put off um, by our sinfulness. He's not letting go. 
And maybe you've grown up in such a way that that feels like punishment that he's not letting go. But that's just the embrace of a loving father. He'll never let you go. No matter where you've been and where you're going and what you've done. His pursuit of you um, is a loving pursuit. And what he's asking is that um, as you turn around that you'd stop pretending. Hold on to the real thing. God, I thank you for the gift of um, songwriting and the gift of men and women who are empowered by your spirit, um, firmly planted in your word that write songs for us that stir affection, stir emotion in ways that um, other things don't and can't. Thank you for the power that it holds for us. So for those of us this morning who are feeling farther away from you than we wish, and it's felt this way for a long time, or maybe it's just been a season, would you remind us that your grip is secure? You won't let go. Baby steps are enough. That we're making you proud. The baby step is a simple confession or a turn or a whatever it is, God, to know that you celebrate it in us because you've created it in us. Help us to feel your embrace this morning. Your presence is all that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Thank you all. Thank you. We're gonna be in John chapter three um, this morning and um, I wanna carry some of that with us today. Some of, always wanna carry the things that we sing in worship are meant to carry us into the study of God's word. And particularly that last song, um, just to be honest with you, I'm standing before you as a pretender, as one who is prone to pretend. I am sinfully desperate at times for people to affirm me and like me. And it feeds a sinfulness in my heart that then makes me want to pretend things instead of confess things makes me want to um, put on a mask or, again, pretend or fake it uh, in ways that I would not lose someone's affirmation or affection. And I want to say this to you, that as a church, um, we can all be honest about that, that we are all prone to pretend. We all want to be loved. Some of us, like me, maybe more desperately than others in my sinfulness. And, but we can, be, um, we can be honest and open and vulnerable and transparent before the King of Kings who has created us. It's like uh, we're not surprising him. So I wanna invite you in this way, that if you're a pretender, um, if you're with me in that, that you are prone to pretend, you're in good company here today. And I wanna encourage you in this way that we're gonna work for the next however long we have it, continuing to peel the layers off, the layers of costumes, the layer of makeup and masks that we have put on. We're gonna work towards a freedom in Christ. And that's because I've experienced a freedom in Christ that I want you to taste. I want you to experience it. We're gonna do that through the study of God's word and, and through um, worship, through music. So John chapter three is where we're gonna be this morning. Uh, John three for us is one that we are very familiar with, particularly if you're a Tim Tebow fan. Uh, I think Tim Tebow wrote John three. And so we're gonna study John three. I wanna look at a verse for many of us that uh, is central to us, things that it's good. It's a verse that we've memorized. It's one that you've put on your Facebook profile to prove how good of a Christian you are, except for the good Christians put ones from like Haggai, because everyone knows John 3.16, but no one knows Haggai 2.1. So if you did that, you're a real Christian. We're gonna look at, uh, but I wanna look at it in context. What happens for a lot of us is with these familiar verses is that um, two things can happen. One, there's only one way that it, that there's only one flavor that it has. If you've ever, maybe you have a grandmother who makes a particular a meal or a cake, and you only taste the cake that way. If it doesn't taste that way, it's not right. On the other side, sometimes these verses can become stale to us, and what we need is for the Lord to infuse a, um, some fresh life into these verses. So this verse is one that we all know, John three sixteen. it'll be on the screen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. Some of you have learned that in King James and you just told me that I was wrong in the way that I just said that. And uh, we've memorized it in, in different ways. We've seen it on signs at football games. We've seen it everywhere. 
But like many things for us, um, I grew up in the Cliff Notes era of high school. Anybody else do Cliff Notes? I didn't, friends of mine did. I read all of it. Uh, I did not. Uh, I, did, I did Cliff Notes, now you Wikipedia things, which is fine and false, but it's fine. Um, we do the same thing to the Bible, though. We, we, it's a long book. There's, even the books are long inside of it. Just give me the cliff notes, right? Just give me, give, me the, give me the nuts and bolts, and then I can move on from there. This is one of those verses. But what happens is, if we pull John 3, 16 out of its context, it still carries some truth, but we miss the weight of it, the gravity of what's actually been said, which is why it's so important for me that when we preach and teach and study, that we study books of the Bible, we don't just pick and choose what we want to learn that week. We actually study through Scripture. So I want to take John 3, 16, and then I want to put it in context for us in a number of, of different ways. Just a little bit about me. Meredith and I began our ministry career um, in Savannah, Georgia, and we started there at a fundamental independent Baptist church, if you've ever been to any of those. Um, not a lot of joy in those places, but... Um, God called me there. There was joy in this in particular church. We called to lead this college ministry, and so me in my three-piece suit led a college ministry to kids at Savannah State University, Armstrong Atlantic, and a number of different colleges around there. But what we learned over time is that the bulk of our ministry, the bulk of our time, was spent sitting with students who had grown up in the church and who had walked an aisle, had been fire and brimstoned into salvation, had the hell scared out of them into salvation, and and just at the age of 18, 19, and 20, just wrestling, like, ah, it's not working for me. Because it seemed like I was promised if I did this, I would get this, and I'm not getting this. And kids who had done all the right things, they were in Christian school, they, um, they wore the right clothes, they listened to the right music, they burnt the right CDs after camp, like they were doing all the things they were supposed to be doing, but once they go away to college, like, it's not working because the faith that I was told to have as an 11-year-old isn't helping me as a 21-year-old trying to wrestle with my world religions professor. It's just not adding up for me. What I've, what I've learned in Sunday school, what I learned out of flannel graph is just not carrying me through depression. It's not carrying me through uh, marital issues. It's not carrying me, carrying me through the divorce of my parents. And so we had to sit with a number of students regularly and dig into, okay, but here's the question I need you to answer. Do you believe in the finished work of Jesus on the cross? I know you believe in reading the Bible. I know you believe in Christian music. I know you believe in going to church. I know, I know you believe there is a hell. I know you believe there is a Jesus. My question is, do you know, love, and trust Jesus? And for some of these students to come to a realization of like, I no, I don't. I don't. I love what Jesus gives me, but I don't love Jesus and takes us into other conversations. When God called me into uh, ministry, I ran from it at first for a number of years, pursued other things, and finally surrendered to the call of ministry. My caveat to God, which he loves when you give those, by the way, is like, hey, I'll do what you're asking, but just not this thing. Uh, my one caveat was, I don't want to do ministry in the South. I just don't. And so God politely declined my request, and uh, here we are. Um, I... I told God that he wired me differently, that I, I was wired to really do more in maybe the Northeast or even out in Seattle. Like I, I wanted those conversations. I wanted to sit around in coffee shops and have those conversations. I wanted people who hated God and me to show them how good God was. And then what I realized over a number of years, that this, this is where God has called me because I am this. This is me. I grew up in church, gave my life to Christ as a young child did all the right things. I was the firstborn. I, um, I achieved. I did well in school. I pursued things that I should pursue and, and still, still found myself where my drunk friends were and my drug-addicted friends were in their life. And I was like, I've done the right things. Why am I where they are? And had to wrestle and grapple with a lot of that. And so this, what we're gonna study this morning, this is a passion of mine. This is a thing God has so firmly imprinted on my heart that I run from at times because it's discombobulating to a lot of us. It's going to knock us off balance at the beginning. And what I'm asking for you to do with me is just stick with me through it. 
I know it's gonna, it's gonna make you question things and question things about me and question things about yourself. And I, I don't mean to preach a message that makes you doubt anything that you've already been assured of. But I don't want you to leave this place pretending to have a faith that you know you don't have. This is a safe place for you to say, I, I'm not who I'm pretending to be. And I don't care if you're a small group leader, I don't care if you're a deacon or an elder. Now, today is the day of salvation. And there's no shame and embarrassment in giving your heart to Jesus, no matter where you are. Students, if you've told your parents that you're a Christian and they believe you, but you're questioning that, listen, if your parents love Jesus, they will celebrate your salvation whenever it happens. And you are free to wrestle that, and you are free to have that affirmed through the reading and studying of God's word. When I was doing ministry, particularly in Savannah, was something rose up called moral, moralistic therapeutic deism. We've talked about this a little bit, where church moved away from teaching the word of God and began teaching um, seven habits to a healthy life. It was therapeutic. It made us feel good about ourselves. And so we avoided conviction-centered passages. We avoided things that were gonna make us not feel as good about ourselves. And it was all about morality, and it was about your therapy. So what's happened for many of us is we've grown up in that kind of environment thinking that we know something or believe something that deep down we know we don't. And this is not a sermon of accusation. This is a sermon of love. I love you in the same way that I want my kids to know Jesus. I want you to know Jesus. And I'm done pretending. So as we study this today, I'm gonna ask you to just dig in with me. Let's do some work. Let's be vulnerable. Let's be honest with ourselves, which I know is hard to do in church, but you can here. Our track record over the past year or so has proven you can be real here. So let's dig in. Uh, John chapter two, uh, we read the wedding at Cana, studied that last week. At the end of that, in verse 11, it says that then the disciples believed, which should mess with you a little bit because I thought the disciples believed in John one when they began to follow Jesus. What we're learning throughout John's gospel is that oftentimes belief will come after following. Belief will come after witnessing. And so they see this thing at the wedding at Cana, then all things come together and they believe. They believed. Then Jesus from there goes to Capernaum and then he um, ends up back in Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And while he's there, he goes into the temple. The temple had been built as a place of worship. Inside of the temple gates, they were exchanging currency, just like you and I would if we went to a foreign country. And the leaders of the temple said, why are we doing that in the city? Let's do that here. That way we can make the difference. We can make some money to support what we're doing. On top of that, they were selling animals meant for the sacrifice inside the temple gates, taking advantage of the poor people or those who could not travel uh, with a goat or a dove to sacrifice. And they were leveraging religion Leveraging faith to take advantage of people to make more money, to make a name for themselves and to make themselves wealthy. I'm not saying that happens anymore, although I'm saying it happens still today. There are still churches and ministries and nonprofits and places who will leverage the name of Jesus to garner some kind of wealth from it. And Jesus steps to the temple and he begins flipping over tables and he makes a whip and starts um, whipping his hair back and forth. He starts whipping it around. That's, I'm aging myself, and I thought that was a cool thing to say at that moment. Uh, whipping. Um, not a few weeks ago, we were at dinner, and we're trying to read through John with our family. Don't be impressed. It happens like once a week. And so we um, were reading this passage, and my boys were like, what? I'm gonna follow that Jesus. I'm down with that. Like, we should do what Jesus does, right? So can we flip this table? No, what? No. Can I make a whip? No, you may not. You may not. So Jesus does that. Um, so all of that's happening in Jerusalem and people are beginning to take notice. And the way that our Bibles are broken up, we miss some context sometimes. So let's look at John chapter two, verse 23, verses 23 through 25 to put all of this in context. Now, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, Many believed, that's the Greek word pistueo, which means to be convinced or persuaded of something. They believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. Has anybody um, driven 
up in like the northwest side of Georgia, even up in like Copper Hill, Tennessee, that area. Has anyone seen the Sea Rock City signs? Have you ever seen those signs that say Sea Rock City? Keep your hands up, I need to see something. Now, how many of you have actually seen Rock City? Oh man, that didn't work. I have not seen Rock City. <laughs> I need to beta test these before I use my illustrations. Um, driven up there a lot. I still to this day have not seen Rock City but I've seen the signs that say to see Rock City. Um, so I've actually begun to um, worship the sign more than what the sign was pointing to. It's Americana, they're cool on barns, and I like seeing it, but I've actually, it's, it's not working for me. That sign is not taking me to Rock City. What's happening in Jerusalem is that people are seeing the signs, and signs are meant to point you to something. They're meant to take you to the next step. The sign is not the point. Does that make sense? The sign isn't the point. The point is what the sign is pointing to. Here, the people are drawn by the signs, but they've stopped at the sign. They stopped at the wedding at Cana. They stopped at the flipping over of tables. They stopped at his baptism. They've stopped there. Verse, uh, so they believed in his name when they saw his signs. Verse 24, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them. This word entrust is the same word in the Greek that's used for believe in verse 23. They entrusted themselves to him, but he did not pistoio, he did not entrust himself, himself to them. They believed in his name, but he did not give them himself. And that's the whole point of salvation is that we get Jesus. Not that we get pearly gates, not that we get streets of gold, not that we get mansions in the sky, but that we get Jesus. So what's happening, and this should mess with you, if you know your Bible, this should mess with you. They believe in the name of Jesus, and Jesus is not giving them himself. They have what appears to be faith and belief, and yet Jesus is not giving them salvation. Well, why? Because he knew all people. Verse 25, he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So we're gonna study John chapter three, and here's what's gonna mess with us. There is a brand of faith in Jesus that is not actually saving faith. There is a belief in the signs of Jesus, in the words of Jesus, in the teachings of Jesus, that will not save your soul. There is a belief in the works of man, in the effort and discipline of man, in church attendance, in consistent giving that will not save your soul. And I'm not in ministry, Daryl's not in ministry, Cody, Greg, we're not in ministry um, to make sure that we have good people. We're in ministry to see people come to know Jesus. So I'll put this all in context. I'm not putting it in context. John did. But we miss it with the John 3.16 on our eye black. We miss it. And those at the end of verse 25. He knew what was in man. Now, chapter three, verse one. Now, there was a man. Here's what John is doing. John's gonna tell the story about Nicodemus coming to meet Jesus. But notice his language. He's particular with his language. The verse before says Jesus knew what was in a man. The next verse says now there was a man. What John is saying is here is the idea. The idea is that there's a faith that does not save us because he knows what's in us. He knows that we're not actually believing in him. So there are men who don't actually believe, who say they believe. And then, now let me give you an example. Nicodemus, John chapter three, is the example of John two, verses 23 through 25. Does that make sense? I don't wanna lose you. Does that make sense? Nicodemus is the example of what John just told us in John chapter two. This is why this imp it's important that we read the Bible and that we read it in context. There is a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Let me do some work because we don't really use that term Pharisees in our culture. We don't have them anymore as an office. There were two main religious leading groups at the time in the Jewish faith, uh, Pharisees and Sadducees. Pharisees were people who believed in both the written law, the Torah, Matthew, or Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and they believed in the oral law, things that had been passed down through generations. This is, these are who the Pharisees were. They believed in an afterlife. They believed in uh, resurrection. They believed in those things. 
but they did not subscribe to a Hellenistic Greek culture. They did not believe in that. Then on the other side, you've got what's called Sadducees. Uh, Sadducees believed only in the written law. They did not believe in the oral law. Only the written law mattered. And so the Sadducees considered the Pharisees to be liberal because they also considered the oral law to be true and factual. But the Sadducees loved Greek culture. They loved Hellenistic culture because it gave them political wealth. It gave them political capital. It it was great for them. So they subscribed to Greek ways of life. And by doing, the Pharisees thought the Sadducees were liberal because they gave themselves over to that. Does this sound familiar to anyone in our culture? Does this sound like anything we're living in? You're liberal. No, you're liberal. It's all like we're just picking silly things to argue about. Here's where it gets even more real for us. There is something called the Sanhedrin, where it says that he was a ruler of the Jews, meant that he was in the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin was 71 men, 70 men, then the high priest made up the Sanhedrin, which would have been kind of like a, uh, like a supreme court. Um, it was made up, listen to this, made up of Pharisees and Sadducees. Does it sound like to you anything that we're living in today? A government body made up of two different parties who hate each other and vote along party lines. Does that make any sense to anyone in the room today? This is who they are. He is a Pharisee, and he is a devout Jewish man. He loves the law, loves the written law, loves the God of Israel. Uh, Pharisees were more middle class. The Sadducees were making a lot of money off of people. But uh, this Nicodemus is a good man. Like, he's devout. He gives. He gives of his time and his talent and his tithe. He worships well, and he worships holy. In, let me say it in this way. If Nicodemus were to show up at our church, I might make him a small group leader the next week. Like he's just a good man who knows the word of God and leads people well. He is later called the teacher of Israel. This is who uh, Nicodemus is, and he comes to Jesus. Let me put some more context into what's happening here. Matthew chapter 3 Um, remember John the Baptist and we looked at him baptizing and the people came from Jerusalem. Matthew 3, a few verses here. Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan River were going out to John the Baptist and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. But when he, John the Baptist, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, the Pharisees and Sadducees hated each other. What they could agree on is we all hate Jesus together. We want to do away with his ministry and anyone who subscribes to his ministry. So they come out to John the Baptist. John the Baptist says to them, you brood of vipers. How do you really feel, John? How do you feel about these men? Who warned you to, fl- who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Why are you out here? Verse eight, you need to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. He's calling them out. Circle that word repentance, we'll come back to it. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Um, Historically, the Jews in this time would have believed they were given access to the kingdom of God, not because of their faith, but because of their heritage. Because they were um, sons of Abraham, Abraham has many of them, because they were sons of Abraham, they thought they were given access into the kingdom of God or heaven. And John the Baptist is saying, hey, that's not enough. That doesn't give you salvation. For I tell you that God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. I love that. He's like, hey, you don't count. And if it mattered, he just make these stones sons of Abraham to take your place. Verse 10, even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now John the Baptist is getting it. He is preaching here. What he's saying is the Messiah is here, the ax, the Messiah is here, and he's chopping down trees that don't bear fruit. He's chopping down trees of Abraham that don't bear fruit, and you need to get back to keeping fruit um, along with repentance. Verse 11, John the Baptist says, but I baptize you with water for repentance. Circle that phrase, water for repentance. We'll come back to that. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me, Jesus, is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with, circle this, the Holy Spirit and fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. My baptism is about repentance, but Jesus is coming and he will baptize. He will immerse you in the Holy Spirit 
The, his winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Pharisees and Sadducees had met John the Baptist face to face, had been told this, heard about the wedding at Cana, saw what happened in Jerusalem, and now they're really taking notice of Jesus. Back to John chapter three, verse two. Nicodemus came to Jesus, remember this, underline it, by night, and said to him, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do, no one can see Rock City that you do, unless God is with him. Do you see how close Nicodemus is to truth? Do you see how close he is? Rabbi, that's okay, but we know you are a teacher come from God. Ah, more than that. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is uh, with him. No, 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 he is God. That's the whole point of John's gospel. Jesus is God. Nicodemus is so close, he can't see the forest for the trees. And Jesus answered him, truly, truly, verily, verily, or amen and amen, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, well, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, verily, verily, amen and amen. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. This uh, phrase, being born again, has been completely butchered in our society. Now it just means as long as you vote Republican, you're a born-again Christian. But being born again is gonna carry a different meaning in John chapter three, but it was something that mattered to Jews. They would use this phrase too. When a Gentile, someone who is not Jewish, would come to faith in God and would then become a Jew, we call it what's called a proselyte, when he'd be proselytized and becoming a Jew, which meant for any male that he would have to be circumcised, which meant you really need to count the cost of this whole Jew thing if you're gonna do this. Um, when that would happen, they would do a ceremony and they would say then that this Gentile had been born again as a Jew. And they believed the new birth was so significant that that Gentile, now Jewish man, could actually marry his mother because he was from, now from a new family and could now marry his mother. Is anyone interested in signing up for that new birth? No one? Okay. But they understand this concept. This mattered to them. So it's not new to him. So the questions Nicodemus is asking, I think they're tongue in cheek. I think he's just like, come on. These are the questions I'm hearing. Have you heard these questions? But then Jesus says, here's, you must be born of water and the spirit to enter the kingdom of God. Remember we just read in Matthew chapter three? There's a lot of scholarship around this verse and there's six or seven different, um, I mean, quality things that this could mean. I'm gonna share what I think it means based on my prayer and study and context here of being baptized or being, yeah, in water and spirit, be born in water and spirit. If I put it all in context of what's happening, I look at water and I go back to Matthew chapter three and I think what he's saying is you must um, be repentant. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, water of repentance. It's all happening in this same time. Throughout scripture, we're gonna see repentance and water linked simultaneously together. Believe what Jesus is saying here is, hey, you have to repent if you're gonna enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, we, again, have kind of downgraded what repentance means, and we think, we say it means to change your mind, which it does, but it doesn't mean like you're at Chili's, and you're like, oh, I'm gonna have the bacon burger. Nope, I'm gonna go with the chicken crispers. Like, that's not, that's not what, yeah, yes and amen. That's not what that means. It's deeper. This is not just mentally, well, I'm gonna change my mind. This is a guttural, like a disgust with what you were doing, with what you had decided, and choosing something completely, altogether different. Repenting from our sin is saying, I am disgusted by my sin. Like it makes me wanna vomit when I think about the things I was involved in this week. I'm gonna turn and pursue Jesus. That's what repentance is. It's, a, it's that. It's not just, I was going to, but then I did this instead. This is a really guttural thing. Jesus says, unless you are born of water, unless you repent and you're born of the Spirit, Acts chapter two, Ephesians chapter two, Ephesians four, or Acts four, if we read through all of this, Jesus will always link the Spirit with belief or faith. 
It's the spirit that instigates our belief. We cannot have faith without the um, initiating work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So here's what I believe, and a number of other much more intelligent people than me would say this too. What Jesus is saying is you cannot enter the kingdom of God without repentance and belief in God. You can't. Repentance plus a belief in the finished work of Jesus is saving faith. It doesn't happen in stages. This is something that all happens kind of all at once. I believe it is simple. It is a simple belief. But I'm also gonna land here. If you don't hate your sin, I'm not sure you know Jesus. The mark of the Spirit is conviction. It doesn't mean you don't sin. It doesn't mean you don't have habitual sin. It doesn't mean there are things you can't seem to get out of your own way about. It doesn't mean you don't hide your sin. What it means is, when you sin, do you feel the disgust that comes from the conviction of the Spirit? Not guilt. Guilt and shame will plunge you into death, plunge you into hiding, plunge you into darkness. Is there a conviction that says, oh, I, gotta make, I gotta get this out? I need to tell someone, I need to get this out of me. I believe what Jesus is saying and what Nicodemus has missed is, hey, to believe, to have saving faith, to enter the kingdom of God, you gotta have repentance and you gotta have belief. You have to know, love, and trust God. I think he's gonna prove it even more in verse six. He says, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Flesh can only give birth to flesh. Uh, flesh is a, uh, an analogy for sinful behaviors, for our own sinful nature. Sinful nature only gives birth to sinful nature. No matter how we try to dress it up, no matter how we try to costume it and disguise it, sin only gives birth to sin. Flesh only gives birth to flesh. If you've ever been around um, younger kids who love to wear costumes, they embody that character. We were at the Wilkerson's house um, last night and little Everett Wilkerson pretended to be a dinosaur. He fully thought he was a dinosaur. Tried to unhinge his jaw to eat me. Didn't, couldn't happen. I know he's not a dinosaur. He knows he's not actually a dinosaur. I know he's just little Everett. No matter how much we try to disguise our sin and pretend that we are dinosaurs, we're not dinosaurs. We're just little boys pretending. Nicodemus has tried to disguise his flesh He's tried to dress it up with his righteous activity. He's tried to dress it up with his memorizing scripture. He's tried to dress it up with his heritage. And he knows, it's why he's coming to Jesus. He knows it's not working. You and I can't dress up our flesh with church attendance and giving and leading a small group and uh, serving in a ministry. We can't dress it up. Sin begats sin. Flesh will always give birth to sin, no matter how we try to pretend it's not and dress it up. Galatians 5 Paul tells us that those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. What is repentance? You kill your flesh. You hate your sin so much, you do everything you can to kill it. Now, are there times you fall back into it? Yes, yes, Paul tells us that. There are times we do what we don't wanna do and don't do what we need to do, yes. Jesus is trying to reveal to Nicodemus, I know you're doing all kinds of righteous things, but you're aware it's sinful. You're aware that your motive behind doing it is sinful and therefore you are not as righteous as you're pretending to be. That's why Jesus says in verse seven, so don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. You know it, I know it. Let's quit pretending, you know. Now this word you is plural, um, so it's Greek for y'all, Y'all must be born again. And he's referring to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and religious leadership. Hey, you guys must be born again. I think Nicodemus would have been fine if Jesus said, hey, the Gentiles need to be born again. Nicodemus would have affirmed yes and amen. But Jesus says, no, no, no. You all must be born again. Just like John the Baptist. He can make these rocks, sons of Abraham, if he wants to. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, and so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Here's what Nicodemus can't figure out. Why, why are these unlearned, ignorant men that are following you, why do they seem like they know God more than I do? Why did this happen in Cana? Tell me about Mary Magdalene. Why are, are all of these things happening? He can't figure it out, and Jesus is saying, that's the point. You can't control it. 
You don't decide who's in and who's out. The Spirit does that. And you only see the effects of it. Nicodemus in verse nine said to him, well, how can these things be? And Jesus answered, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you don't understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I've just told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And then Jesus is gonna tell him heavenly things just to prove his point. You don't get, you don't get the water and being born again thing? Let me show you how far off you are. This is what Jesus does. In the midst of salvation, he begins to expose that we don't know what we think we know. We aren't who we claim to be. If it hasn't been exposed already, the Holy Spirit will begin to illuminate that in within us. And he's doing it for Nicodemus. Verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, that is the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. This is a reference to Numbers 21. In Numbers 21, the people of God, the Israelites in the wilderness, have suffered uh, a great curse of illness, and they're all rotting. They're all just sick as can be. And God tells Moses, get a serpent, put it on a, bronze it, and then put it up, lift it up, exalt it on a pole. And then everyone who is sick, they don't need to come near to it, they just need to see it. And if they see it, they will find healing. Serpent throughout the Old Testament represents sin and sinfulness. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus, hey, the serpent, actually, the bronze serpent, I'm going to be the bronze serpent. That's a heavenly thing that logically Nicodemus can't make sense of. How would the Son of God, how would the Messiah take on sin? But we know he does. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. And then verse 16 for God so loved the world. And Nicodemus says, no, he didn't. No, he doesn't. He loves Jews. He loves Israel. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Pharisees believed they were on the earth for the act of condemnation. They loved condemnation more than they preached salvation. And Jesus is undoing this for him, saying, hey, don't you get it? Messiah hasn't come to condemn, but to save but then he calls out Nicodemus in verse 18. Do you understand, Nicodemus, that you are condemned? Not because I pronounce you condemned, but because you don't believe in Jesus as the only son of God. Then Jesus is gonna really go after it in these next few verses. Remember, back in the beginning of this chapter, Nicodemus came to Jesus when? At night, in the darkness of night. We're gonna study John chapter four. Aaron Young, who's coming in to do the marriage weekend, is gonna preach from the um, woman at the well in John chapter four who meets Jesus in the middle of the day at high noon. Jesus uh, meets Nicodemus at night. Keep that in mind. This is the judgment, Jesus says. The light has come into the world. Who is the light? Well, John told us in John one, Jesus is the light. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. He's telling Nicodemus, do you realize when we're talking right now? Is it light? Oh, it's dark? Interesting. Because people love darkness rather than the light. Jesus is calling Nicodemus' righteous acts evil. He's calling them evil. Everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Do you see what Jesus is doing? He's calling Nicodemus, who Nicodemus already knows that he is. I'm a sinner in need of a savior, and all my righteous acts aren't bringing peace to my heart. I've done all the right things, I've memorized the right things, I've said the right things, I've sung the right things. 
I'm a teacher, I'm generous, I give financially, I sacrifice, I'm doing the right things, and yet I can't seem to find peace in my heart. And Jesus is saying, I know, I know. It's because you haven't called those things unrighteous yet. You haven't admitted your evil inside of you. You're still pretending those are okay. And the magnifying work of salvation, it begins with illuminating the evil that lives in every single one of us. Just because your evil is different from mine doesn't mean that you're any less evil than I am. He's illuminating it. And Nicodemus is gonna be faced with a decision. When his sin is exposed, what's he going to do? For us today, here's what we have to wrestle with. When our sin has been exposed or will be exposed in a saving knowledge of Jesus, what are you going to do? Will you run to the light that it might be exposed, that it might glorify your Father who is in heaven, or will you run back into the darkness? Nicodemus has a chance here. And what we don't understand about salvation is this, that salvation is a violent assault on our sinfulness. And we don't like our sinfulness being touched We wouldn't say it that way, but it's true. We are comfortable in our sinfulness. I'm comfortable in my pretending. I'm comfortable in being a hypocrite. I'm comfortable in my hiding. I'm comfortable in being a people pleaser. I'm comfortable in so sinfully desiring that people like me. I can control that. But when that gets exposed, it's not comfortable but like any good surgeon who wants to heal us of a disease, Jesus will expose the disease within us. We're wrestling symptoms and Jesus is gonna reveal what's underneath the symptoms. Do you feel like your sinfulness has been attacked? Feel like the things that you run to has been attacked? Well, God's working then. He's working Then it's the question of when it's exposed, what are you going to do? Will you repent and believe and find salvation there? Will you choose darkness or choose light? I think for many of us, um, it's, it's that we have only done one or the other. We've repented but not believed. We believe but haven't repented. I think Nicodemus's biggest issue was that he was afraid to repent because to repent meant that he'd have to confess. And we don't like to confess our brokenness our sinfulness. I don't. In many instances in my life, it has to be forced out of me. And I hate that. I want to be willing to confess. So for those of us this morning who maybe you have believed without repentance, does your life look like this? Do you keep adding on new things to try to satisfy it? Do you add on new tasks? You're doing new things. You're serving in new ministries. You're trying to give more consistently. Do you feel guilty but not convicted? Do you feel like there's no anchor for your soul, you're tossed to and fro? Are you comfortable in your sin? I think then there are some of us this morning who we've repented but we haven't had any belief. And so we become very legalistic towards ourselves and towards other people. And we too suffer with guilt and shame but we are self-centered in our endeavors. We are the people who pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. I'm gonna try harder. I'm gonna do better. I'm gonna be more disciplined. I'm gonna wake up earlier. Well, then you aren't believing in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross that says you are pure as the white snow. You are free from the chains that have bound you and you can walk in new life. But maybe for some of us this morning, what's being exposed is that we actually aren't following Jesus. We don't believe in Jesus. We believe in the gospel of religion or the gospel of our effort or in the gospel of a miracle, and we don't actually believe in Jesus. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes, and let's just reflect before we wrap up this morning. We love you. Like this, I, I don't want to conjure up an anxiety and a questioning of faith that, that the Lord hasn't already begun to do in you. As a minister of God's word, I have to teach the text. Is there anyone here this morning who would say, you know what, right now, through the text, through the work of the Spirit, I, I'm, I'm questioning some things. 
I've done the right things. I've been pharisaical even, but I just, I don't know that my faith is in Jesus. Would you, you wanna raise your hand? Just encourage and say, I, I don't know. I wanna have a conversation. I don't know. I wanna make sure. Is there anyone this morning though who would say, no, I'm following Jesus, but I think I've given up on repentance. I don't hate my sin like I used to. I wanna get back to hating my sin. I can't get out of it. I, I think I've grown comfortable and I think I actually like it. If I would raise your hand and say, would you pray for me that I would hate my sin? I wanna hate it. I wanna hate the fact that I gossip and talk about people. I wanna hate that I uh, make a big deal out of other people's sins and don't worry about my own. Anybody this morning would say, yes, would you pray for me? Praise the Lord for your honesty. Is there anyone here this morning who would say, no, I, I'm well aware of my own sin. I feel like I confess and repent that moment by moment. I'm having a hard time believing and trusting in the finished work of Jesus, that, that I'm enough. Would you raise your hand and just say, no, I need your prayer that I would believe that the finished work of Jesus has saved me. I'm with you. I'm with you. God, would you meet us here? We're in different places trying to figure out how to live our lives and how to follow you and worship you best. There are many of us here this morning who, um, Lord, we've grown accustomed and comfortable with the sin that lives in our house. Would you uh, make us hate it, make us despise it, help us to call it what it is. It's not a mistake, it's not an accident, it's not a prayer request, it's gossip. And it's sin and it's addiction. Would you just help us to call it what it is that we might hate it and take steps towards turning to you? And for those of us who just need you to help us, God, we believe, would you help our unbelief? Help us to believe that at the cross, you paid the debt for our sins. We don't have to earn your love. We don't have to earn your grace. We don't have to earn your affection and affirmation. You give it freely to us. Uh, meet us here today, God. And in the work that you've begun to, to do in our hearts, God, don't let it stop. Continue to push us forward to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to share a few things before we dismiss. Um, if you're new here and you want have some questions about our church, you wanna know more, Daryl will be over here at the gathering place. If you have questions about salvation or what does our church look like and what do we believe, we'd love to have a conversation with you there. We're starting FPU, Financial Peace University, um, February 21st at 9.45. It'll be during the small group hour. Ray Koss will be leading that for us. Meredith and I have done it. It's made a huge difference in our life. We live by a number of those principles even now. I wanna encourage you, if you're struggling just with some debt or you just need to recalibrate, I wanna invite you to this. We can sign up in the gathering place with, is that Jeremy? But Jeremy and Daryl will talk with you over there. If you'll stand and I'll give us the benediction and we will be dismissed. Thank you for hanging with us this morning. I pray that God met you in a powerful and a fresh, fresh way. Church, as you go, may you be a church. May we be a people um, aren't, who aren't compelled by obligation, but compelled by the grace of Jesus Christ. May we know for sure that Jesus is who he says he is. And because of that, we are who he says that we are. May we stop pretending and may we go in grace and grace upon grace. Grace and peace be with you. You are dismissed. We love you.